protocols of how we do next-gen sequencing, but I bet that there's a lot of variability from laboratory to laboratory about what those standards are, and part of that may be based on application. Inherited disease has different standards than uh, cancer testing, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a major issue, and, and especially for payers. How do they know the quality that, that they're getting? And I don't know if Naomi wants to comment, but, um, or one of the other payers in the room, but um, it's, it's difficult for payers. Hmm. Yeah, I would certainly in all um, items like this separate regulatory from payer communities and not blend those two. For the FDA um, over the last five years, um, they've been welcome participants, attendees in our ISCA, now ICCG consortium, and after every meeting, they comment that they're really pleased to see the community working together on a voluntary basis to create standards right. and to share data. And it makes them feel like they don't need to do anything to regulate the evolving genetic te testing landscape in the laboratory developed test mode. So you don't want to convene the FDA. You don't want to ask them for official opinions. You just want them to yeah. attend and hear that the community is making a best effort to share information, work together, improve quality, improve standards, and they're very happy to come and listen and participate and make comments, et cetera. But beyond that, uh, they simply don't have the manpower and ability to do very much. And so they're watching the technology as it rapidly emerges um, and so they're very good participants and discussants, but uh, I would avoid language like convene, which makes it sound official, and I'd separate regulatory from payer issues. Engage. I, I do think that the FDA are relevant in that they're not only seeking to regulate LDTs, but um, also sequencing platforms and clinical decision support systems. I'm doing a job for you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, so L, I mean, LDTs is certainly the, probably the primary issue at the moment that generates the most discussion, but some of the things that um, Liz was talking about yesterday, like genome in a bottle, looking to um, create reference materials and, um, and standards for sequencing platforms and so on, so. Thanks. <laughs> All right, well, it sounds like we need to go back and rework uh, this particular uh, idea, and we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Um, the other thing we heard uh, yesterday, I think, was that, um, and here we don't have good ideas about what that should look like, but that we really need to be thinking hard about developing a standards um, IT project that uh, would make sure that we've got people fully engaged, whether it's the folks generating HL7 messaging uh, approaches or um, the people thinking about, you know, how do you report back genomic values in uh, electronic health records, <coughs> that they're, and, and I think that also probably extends to uh, some work where, where places like Emerge and Page have done some work in the area of uh, phenotype standards, but we probably need to think hard about standards discussions. And uh, the one um, group that was not able to join us at this meeting it was the Office of the National Coordinator, and it seems like uh, engaging with them is an important opportunity here, uh, especially maybe if we had a consortia of uh, groups sitting around the table who were felt that this was a, an important issue for them to tackle and address. So. Thoughts or comments about, about that? So having just walked in the room, sorry my bus was late this morning. Um, on the, stand, the, the IT standards, um, formatting that comes off the instrumentation has been, maybe Brad, you know something about this? I don't know, it's been VCF files have been the standard format that's been coming off, but I'm not sure everybody's using them um, or that there is a standardized variant calling file format, and I would think development of things like that that are um, common across platforms would be really helpful. I guess you'd have to go to industry for that, 
honestly, because they're the ones who are writing the, the stuff. But um, it seems like that'll be really important. Yeah, I, I think we've kind of settled on a basic format of VCF, just a, you know, the way it's a nice file format for computationally analyzing and, and tracking the, the variant data. But, but the actual work that goes under that the actual mutation callers is, is still a bit of a wild west with a lot of variability that's still to be settled. We're driving towards some some common tools, but certainly not there yet. I mean, the other thing that <clears throat> that underlies the uh, VCF file uh, is it's based off some type of a referent. You know, you call the variance against a referent, and, and we really don't have a good reference at the present time. And so the idea that uh, we're somehow calling something a non-variant when it could, in fact, be a very important variant is, a, is another piece that we have to understand. And so, you know, using a different file format like a BAM or something that has everything in it where you could go back and, and re-annotate as we learn more, uh, th those are the sorts of discussions I think we need to have. Right, I mean, and I, the, I, I would VC notice go ahead. The, it's the VCF file is not what comes off the machine. Right, right. It's the rod. And, yeah. and, and, So for those that haven't attended all of the genomic medicine groups, uh, one of the working groups, the task force groups, or working groups, I guess we're calling them, that came out of uh, GM2, or I think, uh, was a sequencing working group who has thought a lot about this issue of actually how do you compare different laboratories, so to Deborah's points about uh, standardization across uh, different laboratories that are generating sequence, and then also this very important issue of um, even ten, 10 years after the human genome is still not perfect. Um, and so there's areas where there might be improvement in, you know, the underlying reference sequence or uh, m maybe we, m more likely, we need a variety of reference sequences to reflect the ancestry of the uh, individuals that are, are being sequenced. Um, yeah, w w uh, relative to the databases, a lot of the database is also uh, the reference sequence is actually reversed, and, re and uh, uh, the variant is the real. The most common is actually the variant. Um, this is pretty common. Is there some mechanism? One thing that might help us is to have a mechanism to actually fix all these things. Is there a? I, so, I, like, we're sequencing a lot of people, and we see clearly that there's reversal of, right. uh, of alleles. Is there some mechanism to start Deanna fixing Deanna Church these? is working on this, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. there's a whole, it's a human re reference, human genome reference consortium. Right. And, um, yeah, there, I think there'll be a new reference coming out this year. Right. Um, HG. And, 20. The reference But then there are also doing a lot of work yeah. to, thinking about the clinical application yeah. of the references is, is the next phase. Yeah. And the reference materials that we're working with NIST and the Genome in a Bottle Consortium, should, I think it's going to be something like eight individuals or something that should be sequenced to at least the completion of the reference sequence. And we're working to make those reference materials so they should be highly characterized. So hopefully a lot of that will get worked out with a lot more. Um, sequencing being done. And do those eight individuals reflect different race ethnicity? Uh, I don't know. I know some of them are from a family so that you can do um, Mendelian checking, basically. Um, but, but I think there is a desire to have people of different ethnicity. But underlying the reference materials is just that sequence is sequence. So it doesn't really matter what ethnicity you are. They're not intended to be references to say that these people are normal representatives of any particular population. I recall there are, there are I think, three or four trios, and they're all from a Utah family. Is it the Seth, the Seth I think it is. I can't, can't recall. They're Utah. Well, my point is just that there's a lot of sequencing going on, so we can increase the depth and accuracy of that quite a bit if we had a mechanism for collecting so we do, and I encourage you to look online at the Genome in a Bottle um, Consortium where that's actually being looked at. So, so from my perspective, I mean, I think that, you know, clearly there's a lot of work that's being done on what might be characterized as the basic science sequencing side. What I'm not as convinced about is that 
those folks always know the endpoint that we're ultimately wanting to get to in terms of clinical use and are keeping that in mind as these things get done. So I guess that's what I'm trying to, um, where I think we could potentially do this relating to uh, standards is just to say if we ultimately want to use this in the clinic, then how do we represent all of this in a way that it would be consistent across any clinic that you're in that is using genomic sequencing, that we're calling it the same thing. That's where we really need, I think, a little bit more energy to go into. I think no, no one had more energy in this in this group than Howard Jacob, who was who was really quite engaged in trying to address these things. And I think he kind of got the message: well, this is being done. You know, you don't you don't need to worry your little head about it. And and I and I think that's unfortunate. Uh, yeah. So we so we need to re-engage him. And unfortunately, you know, he was unable to, to come to this meeting. But uh, but I think he he wanted to work with our sequencing centers and and other sequencing groups, and was sort of told, oh, well, you know, we're still coming to some agreement or or whatever. So so we need to figure out a way to re-engage. Yeah, we talked about this a lot in, I think it was GM2, and I was involved with that sequencing group as well. And I mean, the point is an excellent point that the, the data sort of coming off the machine then goes through a process where you call variants. And there are about five or ten callers out there, and different places use different ones. And, you know, again, part of a consortium like Thousand Genomes, we see it all coming into one central clearinghouse and then have to merge it all into one data set. And there are definite differences, especially as you get to indel calling and structural variation. Uh, structural variation is very a very unsolved problem. Um, so I think it's still something that needs a lot of attention to come up with sort of a standard, you know, what are we going to use to call variants and, and interpret them? It's going to be directly relevant to the CRVR because if that's going to be the clinical interface for the annotated database, then we have to have that solved uh, if that's going to be viable. I'll be a little bit of a nihilist. Uh, it's one thing to figure out what the what the genome is, to figure out uh, you know how they what the indels and CNVs are. That that that's one aspect. But but if you're if you're surveying ground, what you do is you just put a stake in the ground, and then you measure from that. And it doesn't really matter whether we have a uh, reference genome that has a lot of uh, unusual mutations and everything, and everything all the normals are all called as a variant off of that. It's a point to measure. And to be able to move forward in, in clinical genomics and to just be able to use it and develop the software, uh, just m making a call and establishing a reference has a huge benefit. Um, and, and then we can go from there. And, and the people working on, on the, the back end, what is normal and what is the normal range of normal, can, can use that same reference. It's fine. But it's basically the idea of, of establishing zero. It doesn't matter whether you use Kelvin or Celsius. You just you can measure a temperature. But, but sort of a different later. point is that you know if we're going to portray this as a, an exact science to the public, and then we miss a copy number variant that's relevant to cancer, and we don't diagnose it correctly. So there's sort of that space that's well beyond into that, the future now. All you're doing is establishing that you're going to refer to whatever zero, you know, whatever the copy number is, and you're going to measure off of that point. And then you can actually, yeah. everybody can agree on the terminology. And it's just a terminology question. It doesn't establish what normal is. It but establishes what the reference I is. I think the, the, the point may be that not, not where the stake is, but whether you're using a meter stick or a yard stick to measure yeah. from yeah. it. So um, I, I think, you know, yeah, it doesn't matter in a sense what the reference is, but part the, the idea that you have to have a caller that can actually call what's there is really important, and different callers work very differently on different structures. So I think this is a good opportunity for us to re-engage the sequencing working group um, and Howard, who is, is unfortunately not here, but is a member of the genomic medicine working group. So. Um, and then the, the final we wanted to talk about, uh, which is actually where we began yesterday, was the discussion on a need for a national strategy. So uh, as, a, as a way to just, and then I realize this is a very complicated slide, but um, what, what this is an attempt to sort of catalog a variety of areas where uh, other national organizations uh, or other organizations such as the IOM or AMA have weighed in um, on such topics such as, you know, service delivery infrastructure for requesting and receiving genomic results. 
um, the provider and patient friendly model interpretive test reports, uh, informatics infrastructure, data sharing, uh, information, uh, standardized information phenotype, we've just spent a lot of time talking about that, uh, training and development, consent models, et cetera, et cetera. And, it, and if you just look at sort of UK, Canada, Italy, um, the European um, Science Foundation, uh, CAP, IOM, and AMA, you can see there's really pretty good overlap in terms of some of the topic areas that uh, these sort of either national organizations or uh, nations themselves uh, feel is important. Based on the discussions yesterday, using the same set of topic areas, um, this is an attempt, uh, I suspect it may be imperfect, and one of the things we thought we would do was circulate this and invite um, the people who are alleged to have some alignment here to weigh in on whether that's accurate or not, um, but to capture some of the discussion we heard from uh, Air Force, uh, VA, CMS, FDA, et cetera, uh, in terms of what areas they thought they were, they, um, were engaged in or had uh, a role in helping define. And the hope is that by thinking about this matrix um, and then maybe how it may align or not with the other national matrices on the previous slide, um, you actually can get to the point where now I'm just using the UK Human Genomic Strategy Group uh, and what their efforts are, you might be able to get to uh, sort of a straw man draft white paper that might be able to be generated uh, by a working group from this group to produce uh, a national strategy that, again, this is using the UK one, but we could do a search and replace and hopefully uh, more than that, but a search and replace on NHS for, uh, you know, the United States and think about are, what are the issues that are unique to implementing a strategy in the United States. And one that's going to come up immediately, of course, that we spent a lot of time talking about yesterday is the fact that we don't have an NHS. So we, we need to deal with an environment where there's a thousand flowers blooming out there, so to speak, and we need to think about how to, how to, how to manage that. So the, the thinking, so I just wanted to open it for discussion, but uh, maybe start by asking the question, does it make sense for us to think about maybe a white paper that could lay out a draft U.S. national strategy for genomic medicine that everybody could participate in drafting to the level that they feel comfortable participating in? Um, so let me, let me just start for opening up discussion. Is that a worthwhile activity? Is something we should pursue? And then we can talk about how we might do that. But so thoughts about is it worthwhile? I see a lot of nods, but. Thank you, that's terrific. Other thoughts? I do think that's um, worthwhile um, with the caveat that it really be socialized and committed to. Um, we, we've had another initiative in um, our health system, which we call the transition from healthcare to health, and we've had a lot of discussions about the national prevention strategy, which our colleagues in um, HHS uh, have been um, championing for quite some time, but that seems to have fallen on deaf ears, and I would hate to see a, a strategy like this go the same route. I think a national strategy would be wonderful if it actually resulted in a national strategy. Because um, the question becomes not, can you put nice words on paper, but what, are, what mechanism is going to exist? And the culture here is not one of coordinated effort. And, 
changing that culture becomes a much harder process than writing a strategy down. Rex. Yeah, I would pick up on what Bruce just mentioned. Uh, I think one aspect that hasn't come up in the conversation so far is that there's a very active marketplace in this area, and that marketplace is out of the gate, and the question is, to what extent is sort of a white paper strategy that's coming from here actually going to have traction in the marketplace? And I think that's something to think about. Uh, that's really a reality that we're facing. There are many companies, many startups, etc., active in this area. And to what extent, you know, a paper will be relevant? That's a question that I want to put out. It seems like in some of these earlier meetings, and I've heard this before, that you know that there's a big question as to whether genomic medicine will just vastly expand the cost structure of healthcare, <laughs> or whether it will actually have a benefit in the long term. And so, I'd, have we really answered that question sufficiently to propose? I thought that's what a lot of these demonstration projects were about. Would it, you know try to figure out is it just going to cost us? you know, hundreds of thousands more per person per year, and can we afford that, and who's going to pay for it? Or will it actually bend the cost structure down, and it's a good investment? I think it would be an appropriate, appropriate way for us to move forward. I would once again echo what I mentioned, uh, I guess, later uh, last evening. If we can have reasonable stretch goals so we can attain what we hope to attain, but also get some easy victories. I mean, first point is the idea of, okay, BAM files, variant files, which file we're we gonna do? Is there a baseline of analytics that we need to have that we can all concur on and say that this is what we're going at? Anything above and beyond that is proprietary to the given individual's institute or whatever, but this is what we're all agreeing upon. You know, it has to be aerial 12 point font. But if you wanna have, you know, you know, sans serifs or serifs or who the heck cares? I mean, that's your problem. You do whatever you want, but we'll agree that this is the format we're submitting things under. If we can get ourselves aligned in that, I think we already have a good playground to work on. We can also then get the, uh, the public entities that are trying to push this down our, everybody's throats to have them align with what we expect of us as being servants of the public. We need to do that. We need to be those individuals that help the public. And I think this is a mechanism that we can have slow victories and actually people looking at us and trying to see where we're going and try and follow instead of trying to go for laudable goals, which are laudable but unfortunately unattainable more, more often than not. Well, I'll just uh, co comment. You know, I, I think um, I, I take uh, both both Bruce and Irwin's points, but on, on the other hand, if we don't have a starting point, if we don't put a stake in the ground somewhere, um, then we're going to see chaos emerge as all the, the right. commercial organizations do whatever it is that they're going to do. I was really struck by the comments some of our colleagues from the Navy met yesterday about how they felt almost abused by some of the uh, you know, companies coming to them and saying, you need to use our platform or you need to use our approach. Um, and and a, a white paper is not going to solve that problem. I, I, I clearly get that, but I, I think it's a, probably an important starting point for us. And if we don't have that stake in the ground, then, you know, it, it will be chaos. Can I, can I hazard a, um, a comment that at the risk of overly, I mean, you can, you know, shout me down overly bureaucratizing this, or maybe it's not what this group wants to do, but OSTP, although that might be the place to go for this Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, um, to start looking at a national strategy that would also include infrastructure and incentives. Because um, the grassroots part has often not worked, where you try to just have everybody hold hands and sing kumbaya. Um, <laughs> So um, I, that's a place to consider um, if, you, if you wanted to really try to build the, the policy and the infrastructure. And, and actually, to, to that point, uh, certainly at least through PCAST, um, 
NHGRI is pretty well connected in with that. So that's, that's actually a, a, a good idea, a good suggestion. Might be, might be helpful to get some comments from our policy group as to whether you have any, any thoughts about how, how best to engage them or maybe you don't want to address them yet. So, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that we should certainly talk to OSTP and see um, to what extent they're willing to engage. They are very interested in technology issues and big data issues, and so this may be something that there's a willingness to engage them around the, the technical issues in particular and some of the policy issues that are associated with those, and that would be um, a broader way to approach it than just through HHS, so it's worth exploring. So would the appropriate way to do that be um, engage them with an early draft? I think that we should think about and, and have some preliminary conversations with them first and figure out what is the best way and at what point is it productive for us to plug in to their infrastructure. We have, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say we have some good contacts at the staff level as well so we could certainly run by this conceptually.
So will this national strategy be for the government? Um, because that's what it seems to be targeted at. And there's industry and academia and you know, many other players in genomic medicine. And, and so how do you engage those individuals in uh, buying into this national strategy, I think, would be something very important. Um, unless you are targeting just, not just, but, you know, federal government agencies. Yeah, I think our, you know, our hope was to, to at least get started with federal agencies that, that to some degree hadn't been really, you know, engaged, at least not to our knowledge, uh, you know, in, in much of a concerted way before. So, so yes, each agency seems to be touching this elephant and, and working in it in a, in a particular area, but not, not in a concerted way. Um, and, you know, it doesn't all have to be in lockstep, certainly, but there, there needs to be at least some understanding and some, some coordination across them. Uh, I, I think our, our expectation would be that we can't do anything within the government that doesn't extend outside of it and, and involve and get, you know, input and, and advice and, and, you know, participation by other groups as well. Not quite clear how to do that when we don't even really have anything, you know, we don't have it yet. So, um, and I think having everybody, you know, th this group around the table is, is hopefully giving the various agencies the, you know, the, the input and the voice from other groups. Industry is not heavily represented here. We've been a little bit nervous about engaging them at, and what stage we need to do that, but obviously it's getting close. Well, well, and there's also the whole issue of the payer system, um, which is not all government. And, and, and so that's a very important aspect of moving gen genomic medicine forward, um, you know, and, and all the providers and physicians who are out there. Um, so I, I would just suggest that if this is put out as a federal government strategy for coordination around genomic medicine. It should be labeled as such so that people don't, who aren't in the government, are, aren't offended that they're not being included or their views considered or represented. I think that it's, it's a good point. There's been a, a and, and uh, Derek, I think, is going to report later on some of the discussions we've had with, with payers that, that feeds into this. Um, but we also want a practical process by which we could actually think about generating a document. And so part of the deliberations around that draft document would be, you know, who, what the scope is and <coughs> who gets fully engaged. So just in the, <coughs> all right, Naomi. Well, I, I will just mention as I look at the chart up there, I'm really disappointed not to see BCBSA Tech noted as a, um, as in, in the space of evaluating clinical validity and utility, because we have been in a leadership role in that regard in a decade, and, yeah, no, and we would love to. We would love to add you. I, I think be, be aware that that I, this. I, I understand. I'm just saying. Whoops. We we have contributed uh, probably more syntheses than EGAP has mm -hmm. at a faster rate and sooner than mm -hmm. anybody else who can measure, so I'm a little, you know, disappointed we'll to be on the chart. You can yeah. fill it out. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, let, let me note that this, this basically comes from the talks yesterday, yeah. and so we should have had you talk yesterday. We're sorry that we, that we didn't. That, that's okay. I've talked before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to be remembered year to year. <laughs> and, and, and this is definitely meant to be an inclusive thing, because <clears throat> it's the only way it'll be successful is if it's inclusive. Back to the slide, the, I think the very first slide you showed, I just want a clarity on one thing. Could you explain to me how bullets three and five are going to interrelate, if at all? I'm just sort of imagining, if we're, uh, I'm just trying to sort of get a sense for are those two completely separate activities. You're going to convene those groups and look at for more longer term goal, blah, blah, blah. But then separate from that, you're going to develop a national. They may feed in, but. Um, in I think the thinking was, um, and, and again, this, this, this was thinking that was done, but, you know, after we finished last night and before this morning. So, but the, so there, the idea is I may be, maybe not quite fully baked yet, but um, I think the thinking was uh, bullet three was a very specific set of projects that might inform principles. Um, and in, that might go along in parallel with the broader discussion and the generation of a white paper. But those principles hopefully would end up uh, informing what the national strategy might look like. 
Correct. Correct. Parallel, not Correct. series. Yeah. And just just to give some you know people something to chew on. So so there was a, a discussion about you know well gee how could we get them engaged in in reviewing the research plans of the institute? Well that's kind of a big thing, but we have the small thing that are these these small projects, and that'd be a place to start. Okay, I think we probably need to move on since we're already quite a bit over time. But the discussion was good, and I think uh, merited going over time a little bit. Um, we 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 do have everybody's email address. Um, and so unless you send us an uh, email telling us you don't want to hear from us anymore, um, we will uh, send out some communications and invite your uh, participation going forward in uh, these possible next steps that we've talked about. So any final thoughts? I think I lost less, right? <laughs> so I'll have one final thought. I, I, going to uh, Muin's point and Ron's, I think I think getting success stories uh, early on is good. So, uh, so for example, I'm trying my best to implement uh, uniform lynch screening within the VA, but I'm keeping track of it. And, and I think just having a record of a very large healthcare system doing that. You know, we have Ohio, uh, but but things like that, and and the way that we implement and then say yes, and it works, and it saves money, and it saves lives. Uh, and so if we can all, within our own framework, we don't necessarily need to cooperate. I mean, well, it's, it's nice to do, but we don't have to, uh, to uh, to to do things like that. And I was just filling in. You know, something that, that occurred, yes, well done. Um, and something that, that occurred to, to us, I think, was, you know, in the NHS strategy where there's this vision of the NHS will be a leader, well, could you substitute the VA will be a leader in, by 2020, and the VA will do this, that, or the other thing, um, or the Air Force, or, or, you know, the armed services. So, so something to think about. All right, well, we had uh, uh, toward the, uh, actually a couple of times yesterday, but certainly toward the end of the day, we had a, li a little bit of discussion about um, incidental findings, and we thought it would actually be very useful to hear. Um, uh, the, there's been a recent uh, publication from the ACMG on guidelines, and um, we have several people in the audience that participated in those discussions, so uh, Les was going to give us a presentation about that, and that may engender some additional discussion. So. Less the floor is yours. Great.